So I get this question a lot from nurses. What's the difference between ticaglor versus clopidogrel? This is how they differ. One, ticaglor technically does a better job at inhibiting platelets and making them not stick together as much, which can in turn translate to a potentially higher bleeding risk compared to clopidogrel, which was demonstrated in not only the PLATO trial that everybody talks about, but across several meta-analyses as well. Ticaglor is technically a more potent P2Y12 inhibitor, which can possibly explain the higher bleeding risk too. Technically, clopidogrel is a prodrug, meaning that it needs to be converted to its active form through the liver. And it does this through an enzyme called CYP2C19, which ticaglor, we don't have to worry about. It does have some implications for drug interactions because of that. And some individuals, unfortunately, are not as responsive to clopidogrel for this reason. However, we don't do genetic testing routinely to suss out that difference for patients. Three, ticaglor is broken down by an enzyme called CYP3A4, which has implications for patients who are on things like carbamazepine or tegretol, possibly rendering less effective because it tends to chew up CYP3A4 substrates like ticaglor. So perhaps clopidogrel may be more effective and beneficial for your patient in this scenario. Four, ticaglor is also a reversible inhibitor of P2Y12, whereas Clopidogrel is an irreversible inhibitor of P2Y12, which may have implications when we are deciding on whether to reload a patient when switching from one agent to another, or when we're thinking about stopping the ticagrel or clopidogrel before uh, surgery or procedure. Five, another difference is that clopidogrel has two standard loading doses, one in the form of 600 milligrams and one in 300 milligrams. And I think about this in terms of timing and when we need to get the patient's platelets inhibited enough for PCI. For the 600 milligram dose, you will typically see this for patients who are going for urgent revascularization, usually primary PCI in the STEMI context. And if the patient is to be receiving this uh, PCI within two hours, the loading dose of 600 milligrams would be much more appropriate than the 300, as platelet function assays have suggested that you can achieve near maximal platelet inhibition within two hours following a dose of 600 milligrams. In the CREDO study, treating patients with 300 milligrams of clopidogrel at least six hours before their PCI has been shown to reduce the risk of death, heart attacks, and strokes by almost two and a half percent absolute risk reduction. Those patients who received clopidogrel less than six hours prior to PCI did not achieve the same benefit, which is supported by platelet function studies as well and revealed that 300 milligrams did not achieve maximal platelet inhibition within six hours. This suggests that we perhaps may need six hours or at least six hours for our bodies to convert clopidogrel from its prodrug state to its active form, like we talked about earlier. Six. Now, despite the PLATO trial concluding that ticagrelor is superior to clopidogrel for cardiovascular death, heart attacks and strokes, at best we are lowering that risk from 11.7% down to 9.8% over a year's span. However, this is not exactly what the real world data is now revealing to us. Now that we've had over a decade of experience, along with several advances in interventional cardiology over the last decade or so, it seems as though ticagrelor does a similar job compared to clopidogrel for heart attacks, strokes and death, but it comes at a cost of an increased risk for bleeding, which we kind of already knew about, but is now being more apparent to all of us. Somehow, ticagrelor made its way at the top of the Canadian guidelines, and I think that this should be revisited. If you want to dive into this issue a little bit more, check out this video where I'll be going over a couple studies talking about the differences in these two drugs in real world, now that we've had more experience with it over time. Seven, ticagrelor should not be used with more than 100 milligrams of aspirin on a day-to-day -day basis, as it's been speculated that perhaps ticagrelor might not work as well with higher doses of aspirin. And this was first discovered in the North American subgroup of the PLATO trial. So if you have a patient who has concomitant pericarditis coming in with their MI, it's probably not such a good idea for you to have the patient on both high-dose aspirin and ticagrelor. 
In these situations, I generally try to switch them over to clopidogrel instead. Not from a bleeding standpoint, but from an overall efficacy standpoint for ticagrelor. Eight, when your patient has a condition requiring fold anticoagulation, such as atrial fibrillation, most of the data that we've seen is with clopidogrel rather than ticagrelor. And this sort of makes sense knowing that perhaps ticagrelor might not be as good of a drug as we originally thought it was, especially if we have another thing that could make patients bleed more. Nine, patients on ticagrelor are more likely to experience shortness of breath. And this shortness of breath sensation, how um, patients often describe it is more of like an air hunger type of sensation. And this is thought to be related to the pulmonary sieve fibers that get sort of tickled in the lungs when patients are on ticagrelor. And their oxygen saturation is usually fine and they're not in heart failure, but you probably wanna do a physical examination just to make sure, at least I do anyway. 10, ticagrelor potentially be associated with a risk of bradycardia. A lot of patients are also on beta blockers around the time of an MI. Ticagrelor has also been associated with an increase of uric acid and possibly increasing the risk of a gout exacerbation. 11, what, 11? Clopidogrel has been associated with and has been deemed a possible cause of something called leukocytoclastic vasculitis, which is a systemic small vessel vasculitis which is characterized by neutrophils being infiltrated into the blood vessels which can cause some damage and necrosis around the vasculature. Ticagrelor on the other hand has been associated with some diffuse alveolar hemorrhage and pneumonitis and there has been one case report that I found as ticagrelor being a possible culprit for causing a systemic vasculitis. Last is cost. Clopidogrel costs about 30 cents per day versus ticagrelor, even in its generic form, is at $2.90 per day. That's about a tenfold increase in price difference. And I'm not sure if the difference that we are now noticing in real world literature that it's a price I'm willing to pay between the two. Let me know if you think I missed anything and what your thoughts are on these differences between ticagrelor versus clopidogrel and whether you thought this video was useful for your understanding between the two agents. I'm always learning and completely off my rocker for some of these things, but I hope this video can help serve as a bit of a forum and channel that we can discuss some of these topics sort of in an informal setting and to overall enhance everybody's learning. Again, thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you in the next one. Say no to drugs.